my name is Matthew McClure. Um, I'm a co-founder of a company called Mux. We provide an API to online video infrastructure. And one of the things that we provide is this live streaming solution. So you can create live streams, we give you back stream key, and then you can just push our TMP feeds to it. So it's great for live broadcast, but a really common question we get is how can I let my users go live directly from a browser? So right now the current recommendations are usually use native software like Open Broadcast Studio or uh, Wirecast or something along those lines. But people want to be able to just keep people in their applications themselves and not ship them off to another solution, make them download and learn a new technology. Um, so it's understandable why they want to, but unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. So uh, let's talk about a hack I've been working on that's probably a really terrible idea. But uh, So first of all, let's talk about what we mean by live broadcast. We'll give some quick background here. Um, live broadcast is not live chat. So it's a really common misconception, but these two things are actually quite different. So in live chat, you have just two people, two users talking directly back and forth. They can just share video, potentially even peer to peer. So it doesn't need to go get routed through a centralized server. It can just go directly from one to the other. Uh, this latency needs to be like 300 milliseconds or less. You start getting up to like 500 milliseconds, it gets really hard to actually have that like one-to-one -one conversation. You can maybe even have a few peers here. So uh, that can get three, five, ten. Really, depends on how much bandwidth each user can have, because you're kind of constrained by whoever has the least bandwidth to be able to share video back and forth between every person in the chat. Live broadcast, on the other hand, is from one camera feed to hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people at once. Um, and so now you're not talking anymore about a communication, one-to-one -one communication anymore. It's one person kind of broadcasting out to a bunch. So you need to be able to scale it. You need to be able to have affordable costs. Uh, um, but then those viewers don't necessarily need to be talked back in real time. So latency uh, in, in you know 10 seconds, 15 seconds is, is pretty fine. Uh, by the time a person's responded in chat, it it's, should be pretty responsive. So the same technology doesn't really work well for both uh, for a few reasons. So live chat is powered by browser technologies like WebRTC. So that's a suite of APIs that can be used for browsers to communicate with each other peer to peer, get the browser's media, all those kind of things. Uh, live broadcasting, on their hand, is powered by technologies like RTMP. Uh, so RTMP is a server protocol, um, a communication protocol for delivering video. So it's used to be used a lot more on delivery, but now it's kind of standard for getting a broadcast feed into a server. Then that server will transcode that to something for delivery to the end users um, that's a little bit more cheap and scalable, like HLS. And HLS is a format that basically takes video, chunks it up in small chunks, lists those chunks in a manifest, and then players can download the manifest and then keep pulling it for updates. Um, but it can just be hosted on normal CDNs, it's delivered like normal files, it's just HTTP, so it's really, really easy and understandable to scale, uh, and it's cheap, relatively speaking. Okay, so you're probably thinking, if I need to get to RTMP first, let's just go WebRTC to RTMP in the browser. Um, the browsers are mostly like, nah, you unfortunately can't get low level enough um, in the networking level to be able to communicate over RTMP. Uh, okay, so let's. What about the technology we can access? What What about the things that we do have in our toolkit? So, spoiler alert: a server is going to be involved either way. Uh, you're just not going to get from a browser to RTMP without, in some way, involving a server. So, WebRTC to server side implementations of WebRTC it can be done. It's a little bit complicated. The WebRTC spec is large. Uh, and daunting. Um, this has gotten a lot better recently. There's projects like Pion that really make this much easier, but it's still pretty daunting. Um, so you're thinking WebRTC to a server-side WebRTC implementation, but now that implementation is just headless Chrome. Uh, and this can be done. It's actually done really well. Once you're, you know, you basically can have a chat, the headless Chrome instance can just join that chat um, and record it. And the nice thing here is you're just using browser technologies. You can do overlays. You can do whatever you would do in the browser there. And then it's just in the stream. It's really, really cool. The problem is now you're having to run Chrome at scale for every single person that wants to do a live stream, which can be complicated. OK, so what if we just used a piece of that WebRTC spec, get user media, which is the process of getting the browser uh, um, 
microphone and camera, and then we'll just send that over WebSockets. WebSockets are understandable. The server set implementations are common and uh, things that we've all worked with, or a lot of us have worked with in the past. So uh, let's try that. You might be thinking, how would that work? So first we would request the browser's media. So uh, get user media is what I was talking about er earlier. You can set different constraints. We'll just set audio and video to true, but you could, you could adjust that if you wanted to. We'll set that stream. We'll uh, add that stream to a video element so we can see it. And then we'll capture that stream. And then we'll pass that stream to the media recorder, uh, to a media recorder instance, or we'll create a new instance of the media recorder uh, API, which just allows you to basically record content from a browser. And then that recorder will expose uh, this data available uh, event. So every time that event fires, we have a chunk of video. So we'll just fire that chunk of video down a WebSocket connection. I'm ignoring all the process of creating that WebSocket implement or WebSocket connection, but assuming we have a WebSocket connection, now we can just send that video down that WebSocket connection, which is great. Uh, so then the server side of things is also pretty pretty simple and straightforward. It's we have this WebSocket. Every time we get a new connection, we'll spin up a web FMPEG process. Here I'm using uh, a MUX RTMP endpoint, but that could be anything. Uh, when we'll do some cleanup if the FMPEG process dies or if the WebSocket closes. But otherwise, every time we get a new message and it's a buffer, we'll just write it to FFmpeg and then FFmpeg will deliver it via RTMP. So this actually works pretty well. If you want to see a demo of this, uh, you can check out uh, a glitch. Um, it's got everything running. You can see it working in the browser. It's actually pretty cool. It works pretty well. Here you just put a stream key. If you wanted to remix the glitch and use a different RTMP endpoint, Totally cool. Um, and I also wrote a blog post on this whole thing. So if you want to check it out, get more details, um, I go a little bit more into these. So thanks, everybody. Well, that's a lot of knowledge in just 20 or 28 minutes it was. Four great topics. Um, I would, yeah, I would like to invite all the Lightning Talk speakers with me on the stage to do the last round of Q&A of the day. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hey there. Hey. Hello. Good morning, evening, night, whatever it is for you. Um, yeah, I'm going to go straight into the questions. Um, going to start with the first question for Matt McClure. What market are you targeting and why would someone use Mux instead of Twitch or YouTube? Yeah, it's a, it's a valid question. Um, we're, we're a developer facing product. So we're purely just APIs for developers to build into their platform, uh, as opposed to uh, Twitch and YouTube, which were which are much more consumer facing products. So uh, if you're a streamer just looking to go live uh, without mm -hmm. writing any code whatsoever, those are great platforms, you should probably use them. Uh, if you're trying to build a platform, uh, we're, we're probably a better fit there. Okay, so it's, uh, it's more about the target audience, I guess, and that you have more control over what you're doing. Yeah, it's, uh, I, would, I would think about it a little bit like um, uh, a bad analogy that I mentioned in Slack is uh, they're more like the PayPal or Venmo, uh, we're more the Stripe, if you're thinking okay. about it in terms of like payment APIs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is for Jen. What are the reasons why someone like the React Native web team would want to use a div as a button? Uh, the reason is that putting HTML inside of a button is not actually semantic HTML. So they may want to wrap that content, for instance, a card or a block of like an image and text into a div and make that an accessible button instead of putting a button around it. Yeah, so if you have a completely clickable card with different elements inside it, you can do that semantically within a button. Correct. So in that case, you'll okay. want to make an accessible div. Well, you should want to, at least. <laughs> Perhaps. And, and can I say, if, if you don't, Jen is going, going to come and get you? I, I will very kindly tap you on the shoulder and yeah. make suggestions. How about that? Yeah, yeah but tap doesn't work. Uh, then I might have it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not a question, but uh, just for Yuri, a nice tap on the shoulder. 
from Martin van Houten. Not really a question, just want to say, mesh, look, mesh looks awesome. Well, that's always nice to hear. <laughs> Thank you um, very much. Thank you. <laughs> and then, I hope that after you try it, you feel the same and not uh, hate me. <laughs> well, actually, at uh, the company I work for, Albert Heijn, we are using it. And uh, I have to say, it's uh, been a pleasure. So thanks a lot. Oh. Don't You're tell my anyone neighbors. Who I can uh, come visit you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, would be uh, gezellig. Uh, Mike, <laughs> does Ionic support native apps similar to React Native, or is it like a Cordova standard app where it's a web UI instead of a native app? So it's kind of a mix of both, where you there the majority of the UI is displayed in a web view. But you can integrate with custom uh, native views or activities that, on Android uh, and kind of mix which one gets displayed uh, at the web view or the native view, or even just overlay the native view on top of the web view. So you get kind of the best of both worlds. Hmm. It feels powerful. Um, okay, thanks. Thanks, guys, uh, and my lady for this great talks. Um, for the people watching, they're also going to be in the Zoom rooms for uh, questions, but the formal part is now over. I'm going to say goodbye to you uh, for a little bit. So thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>